right now going to talk about the close of probation. I want to talk about one of the most significant events that has come and gone. Many were expecting great things to happen on this day, and perhaps for many it seemed to have come and gone with very little flash, with very little uh, results. A big hype had been made of September 23rd, 2015, when of course the Pope himself would come to visit the United States. There were several things that led up to that day things that have been brought to the attention of many, especially within the faith community. In fact, myself, I did a series called Prophecy, Science, and the New World Order, of which I began to bring out things that God revealed to me in the months leading up to September 23rd that seemed to have been some things that were of a startling nature, things that seemingly we have never witnessed in our lifetime. And I want to rehearse some of those things because I think that that time having came and gone, many have sat back and they're resting on their laurels and they're thinking it was nothing, it was just a big hype. But here recently, God has been stirring in my spirit something that I think is of an extraordinary possibility that I think we need to sit up and take pause. Because I believe that that day was not a fizzle or fading away, but something of the extraordinary took place. I believe it was foretold in Scripture long ago. I believe it's something that we as a Seventh-day Adventist people have been waiting for. And I believe that Many of people are perhaps thinking in the same way and perhaps are not saying anything about it. But tonight you're going to hear something that I will admit from the very onset is very startling. And we need to take attention. And that what I'm saying, you need to measure it not by what comes out of my mouth, but being on your knees and studying the Word of God and letting Him Letting who? Him. Him, Jesus, convict you, not me. Now what I'm going to share with you is something that is brewing and stirring with great magnitude in my heart. It started off as a simple nudging, but now it's a great provocation in my heart. And here's what it is. Let's talk about some of the events that led up to that time. And there are three significant things that I want to talk about. And as we conclude, you will understand why I'm rehearsing these things. Notice, number one, the signs in the heaven that transpired prior to that day. Number two, the day of atonement. And number three, the what everyone? The political and civil what? Events. All of these things combined together paint a portrait and picture for us to truly consider. Let's take the first, which is the signs in the heavens. In Matthew 24, verse 15, it says, When you therefore should see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the hosing place, whosoever, whoso readeth it, let him do what everyone then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Let's look at these two signs, one being in the sun that happened before that day, September 23rd, 2015. The Bible says in Revelation 6, verse 12, and the sun became black as what? Sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as what? Blood. I want you to recognize when that time would come when these things would happen with the signs in the sky. 
is connected here to help us understand the timeline and when these things would occur. In Joel 2, verse 31, the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood. That sounds like the same time that Revelation 6 and verse 12 was talking about. Amen? Before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. The context in Joel 2 is the time of the what? The latter rain. So the events of the sun, moon, and stars would appear during the time that there is an outpouring of the latter rain. Can I pause and tell you something? We just heard a report probably about six weeks ago of a person, a friend of mine, a pastor, who told us about an evangelistic campaign that happened in Africa and the likes of which 400,000 people were baptized into the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Amen. That is almost a half a million people. Now you can tell me and you can say that that was a mighty move of God. I'll tell you that's more than a mighty move of God. That is latter rain proportions. Amen. I want to ask a question. I'm going to be bold enough. And please just be honest. How many of you have heard of a baptism in one setting that exceeded 400,000? Anybody in here? Anybody? Okay. 400,000? That could almost be a nation. At least a state. Amen? In some of the smaller states. So, I'm saying that there's a possibility that even right now, the latter rain is falling. Amen. You're saying, uh-huh, but you're not ready for what I'm about to say. Watch this. Another sign is going to occur. What does that picture convey? What is that? Eclipse. An eclipse. And what kind of eclipse? Solar, solar eclipse. On August 21st, 2017, there's going to be a solar eclipse that can be viewed by every person in the United States. Is that a sign of God's end? In Joel, it says it will be a sign of the latter rain. Now, I want you to think about this for just a moment. Some of you are not getting it. But during the three and a half years from the mark of the beast to the close of probation is a time when the latter rain will be poured out. You're not getting it. Say it again. Some of you, let me say it again. We get it. Say it again. The time of the latter rain occurs between the mark of the beast and the close of probation. Because people need to hear an anointing from God through the power of the Holy Spirit during the time of the latter rain so the loud cry can go and every person can be convicted of the Sabbath. The latter rain occurs between the mark of the beast and the close of probation. And I just told you 400,000 people were baptized. What has to happen before the latter rain falls? The what? You said it, I didn't. Let's move on. Let's talk about the signs in the moon. Some of you have maybe remembered this. There was a sequence of four moons that appeared to be as blood. It caused and created a great stir in Christendom. How many of you heard about these blood moons? This was such a significant occurrence because there will never, there will never be another foreshowing of this type of thing, phenomenon, for another 670 years. Is that significant? Mm -hmm. Does the Bible talk about the moon appearing as blood? 
And in Joel it says that the appearance of the sun and the moon turning to blood would be around the time of the latter rain. Again, when does the latter rain occur? Between the what? Mark of the beast and the close of probation. Let's talk about the Day of Atonement. Okay, let's talk about, in order to get to the Day of Atonement, we need to talk about two things significant. When Rome will regain its power, it has to do two things. How many things? It has to regain its political influence and control over the U.S. government. Would you agree? Yeah. Amen. Rome needs to do that. Number two, gain control over the affairs of the what? Church. The church. That's Protestantism. Protestantism. Amen? Let's talk about the first one. Has Rome gained its influence and control over the United States? And before you answer, think really hard. Think really hard. Look at this. This daily journal occurred before September 2015 as the Pope was marching onward and upward to promote his climate change through what would then be published in August of 2015 as his encyclical. His what, everyone? Let's, let's plug it up before we lose it. You can't lose it. Uh, where is my banner? Do you need that? My, uh, my charger, sweetheart, is in my, my bag. My bag is right there. Look at the end there. Open up on the right hand side there. Yeah, there you go. Right there. Yeah, that long piece. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Go ahead and plug it up quickly. Thank you. Use that one there. That's where we're Yeah. Okay. So this was found in the Daily Journal. Uh, this was, I believe, in 2014 or 2015. Thank you, Joe. I believe we have moved ahead, and this was published as an article in the Daily Journal. I believe we have moved ahead and left God behind. Our factories are closing, stores are going out of businesses, restaurants are closing. Why? Wonder why? God asked us to remember the Sabbath and to keep it holy. We have six days to do whatever, but the seventh day should be to honor our Lord and Savior. Now, this was published in a newspaper, not a religious periodical. If we remember the Sabbath and keep it holy, God will bless our country and town. What do you think? I heard a young man preach the other day, uh, preach the other day and say that the topic was, did God leave us and we didn't even notice? Let us give God back his day so we can hear our grandchildren say that God is blessing us again. What do you think? Would it be worth trying to hear God bless America again. I understand that some jobs do require their employees to work on huh? work on Sunday, but the people who do not have to work on Sunday, let us what? Honor God's day and ask for his what? What do you think? Is it worth trying? My wife and I for three years traveled back and forth to Germany. We, we had the immense uh, uh, the immense privilege of being able to help start a lifestyle center there. And during the time we were there, we come to find out that every Sunday in Germany, the stores were closed in honor of Sunday. It has been widely known by most Europeans that they do no commerce on Sundays. You ask many Europeans, and that's not to say that every place in Europe, but a lot of places have been closed for many years. They do no business on Sundays. Now, I also want to share with you that we need to understand 
that the Pope is on the move and has made his mark in this world in enormous ways that have gotten past us because it's come under the radar. And I'm going to show you how in just a few minutes. This is another paper, The Guardian. Slow Sunday, the simple solution to global what? Who is the leading proponent, proponent to fight against climate chaos and climate change? The Pope. He is the leading figure of all that's leading out in this race. Notice this. We cannot wait until the governments are enlightened enough to legislate and cap the carbon emissions. One thing we can easily do to achieve this goal, we can declare what? Sunday to be a fossil fuel day or a low carbon day or at least an energy saving day. We can start individually and what? Collectively. The long journey to cut carbon dioxide emissions can start in the what? Here and, there and, Here and now. Not long ago, Sunday used to be a day of rest, a day of spiritual renewal, a day for families to come together. But we have changed Sunday from a day of rest to a day of shopping, flying, and driving. However, in the context of excessive carbon dioxide emissions into the atmosphere, which are bringing catastrophic upheavals, we can, we can and should restore Sunday to a day of Gaia, a day for the what? Earth. For the earth. We can enjoy Sunday once more with our family and friends. We can engage in gardening, writing, painting, walking, bake, baking bread, or simply spending time in contemplation. This will be good for our personal health as well as for our health of the planet. We will have time for our friends, take uh, time to play with our children, and time for our family. At a stroke, we can reduce 10% of our carbon emissions into the atmosphere by making Sunday a low carbon day and at the same time make ourselves healthier and happier. So let us make Sunday a day of rest and renewal rather than a day of travel and Oil. Is that profound? Yes. Well, it's nothing new. Because many of us have missed it. How many of you took the time to read at least a portion of the Pope's encyclical? Okay. So here's what I'm going to tell you. What we have not realized is that everything you read in those two papers just now about reducing carbon emissions, allowing the earth to rest on Sunday so that it can promote a greater level of health and well-being throughout the planet is everything that's in the encyclical. So here's what I'm going to say to you. And I'm going to say it in this way so that you get it. The mark of the beast has already been encoded in the encyclical. The National Sunday Law is embedded in the encyclical. Uh, you, you didn't get that. We have been waiting for this formal declaration to come forward. And behind the scenes, the Pope has made his move. And he came to the United States in the halls of Congress after having presented his Sunday law in the encyclical, his intentions and his agenda and purpose. And he stood there, and not only did he address the United States, but then he walked out of there, went down the street, and went to the United Nations and told the world. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yes. Yes. And he's the leading proponent in this move and has already told the whole world, and most of you Adventists who have raised your hands, you know that that's what he put in the encyclica, that Sunday is a day to promote a change in this world. And what better way to do it? Now, I'm going to pause for just a moment and have you turn to Revelation 13. What book did I say? Revelation. And what chapter? 13. Revelation the 13th chapter, and notice carefully what the Bible says. Revelation, the 13th chapter, and notice carefully. Verse 15. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, 
that the image of the beast should both what? Speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. Now, how does a, how does a beast obviously represents a what? Nation, a kingdom, or power. How does a nation speak? Through its laws, through, it, through its legislation. Amen? Amen? How does the papacy speak? Through its laws and through its encyclical. It is a message that is tailored not only to the Roman Catholic Church, but it is an announcement to the world. We refer to the papacy as the beast power. Isn't that right? Yes. The beast power walked into the halls of Congress, having already written the encyclical, which has stated in it, in encoded language, the Sabbath. Yes. Stood and spoke yes. to the United States and to the United Nations. And that day has come and gone, and we just say, oh, well, nothing happened. The Sunday law didn't pass. I'm going to show you something in just a minute for something of great consideration. Now notice this. The encyclical, the Pope's subversive introduction to Sunday Sabbath. Congress first then United Nations. I saw one of its heads as it were wounded to death, and its deadly wound was what? Yeah. And all the world wondered after the beast. Now watch this. Most of us think in terms of when we see that all the world, we think all the individuals in the world. And there will certainly come a time when that will you know, unfold. But question, how many of you heard of the Paris Agreement? How many nations under the sun on this earth were represented there? All. All nations. How many of those nations bought into the Paris Climate Agreement? All, but US. All of them. Now, we have someone in office now who is pushing against it. But there's some pushback on him. It's interesting because when we read in Daniel Daniel 11, and I'm not saying this is an interpretation, so please don't leave out here and say, oh, Pastor Brown said the king of the, the South is, is, is the present, the, the current uh, administration, United States administration. But it's funny, it says the king of the South pushes against the king of the North. We know the king of the North is the And right now we see some pushback from the United States who says we don't want to go that direction. That's foolish. It's a hoax, right? But nonetheless, the United States will come in line. You better best believe that. Amen? Yes. Notice this. Now let's talk about gaining control of the affairs of the church. All right? Wednesday, August 12th, before 2000, uh, September 23rd, 2015, in Vatican radio address, Pope says Sunday keeping is so sacred that it is the conduit of every grace of Christ. Wow. If you don't keep Sunday, you don't have the grace of God in your life. That's what he's saying. New World Order implemented in September. See, when the Pope stood before the United Nations, it was coagulating, bringing together, unifying the world under a mission to save the planet. If the Pope came and said, everybody keep Sunday, people would look at him and say, please, you do what you want. But he did say it. He used a tool to do it. He used climate chaos to do it. Are you with me? The whole world wonders after the beast. I'm going to show you some things that are happening behind the scenes to help you understand a little better about what's going on. In January 2014, anyone know who this man is? His name is Tony Palmer. He was present 
at a gathering of evangelical leaders. Isn't that right? Yeah. A leadership conference that was held with all of the big name pastors in the evangelical world. All, every person that had a mega church was there at that convention. And it was during that time that Tony Palmer declared that there was no longer a Protestant movement. And how many of you seen during that video that he actually had a presentation to the Pope and they essentially said, we are on line with you, we agree, no more disunity, we're coming together as one, we support you. You, you seen that, right? Yes. Tony Palmer said, brothers and sisters, Lutheran's protest is over. Lutheran's protest is over. See, let, let me tell you the thinking of most of us, because this is my thinking. We were thinking that suddenly the Pope is going to come and make this announcement and try to force people to obey a Sabbath called Sunday. But that's not the way he's doing it. What he's doing is he's introducing it through another means. And what will happen is as we grow closer toward the end of a certain time period, things are going to happen to the economy. It will collapse. And by the time it collapses, then will be said, you know why this is happening? Because we are not taking care of the earth. You know how we can take care of it? I told you what we need to do. Are you with me? So here's what I'm going to lead you to understand. The Protestants of the United States will be foremost in stretching their hands across the gulf to grasp the hands of spiritualism. They will reach over the abyss to clasp hands with Roman power and under the influence of the threefold union, this country will follow in the steps of Rome and trampling on the rights of conscience. Did that seem to happen? Did you know that on October 31st of this year, they're going to have a formal gathering. It will be the 500th year of the Protestant Reformation, and it will be closed. They said, that's it. The, they had a decree, <laughs> you might say, in 2014, and they're having the close of probation for this year, October 31st. Now, I, I want you to see this. What day was the Pope's visit to America. September 23rd, 2017. Does anybody know what day that was? I'm sorry. That should have been 15. That should have been 15. Does anybody know what day that was? 2015. Somebody said it. It was the day of atonement. Now listen. I'm not a person here to tell you we need to keep the feast. That's not, that's not. But here's what I do believe, that God still uses them as markers. Yeah. Amen. And please don't tell me, I can't believe that, because what was 1844 all about? And that was way after the cross. That was way off after the cross. So don't tell me that, you know, uh, God eliminated those markers at the cross, because if that's the case, then everything falls apart for us except they does. So they're still markers because God uses that to warn his people. Because the Bible says he created the days for signs and seasons. And the word is moedim or moed, which is the same word that's used for feast. God uses them as a sign to his people to help us identify when he's going to work and operate. And you know how I know that? Watch this. Go with me to Acts, the third chapter, verse 19. This is startling. Acts, the third chapter, and verse 19. Acts 3 and verse 19, and when you have it, please say amen. 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 Repent ye therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be what? Blotted out. Blotted out. Question. 
What does that word, those two words mean, blotted out? What kind of language do we usually associate with blotted out? Day of Atonement. Day of Atonement. Isn't that what happened on the Day of Atonement? Their sins were blotted out. Amen? Amen? Now notice what is coupled with this blotting out. Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. When? When the time of what? Refreshing, refreshing shall come from what? Refreshing. The presence of the Lord. What is the time of refreshing? The latter rain. So here it is. Watch this now. The latter rain occurs when the Day of Atonement falls. Let me say it again. For those of you who may not understand, the latter rain occurs on a Day of Atonement. Which makes sense. Because Ellen White says that to receive the outpouring of the latter rain, you have to put away every besetment. Isn't that what she says? On, on the Day of Atonement, what did you have to do? You had to put away what? Every besetting sin. Isn't that right? You had to fast. You had to, you know, pray. And you had to afflict yourself, removing all, all forms of what? Adornment. Isn't that right? So it makes sense. September 23rd, 2015 was the Day of Atonement. And what we just read, what happens on the Day of Atonement? The outpouring. Of the latter rain. I just told you that 400,000 people were baptized just the other day. September 23rd, 2015 was not some mamby tamby debate date. It was a significant marker in time. Now, watch this. Why is this significant? We just looked at the verse. So I'm going to speed ahead. And notice the last thing. Political and civil events. How many of you have ever heard of this called Jade Helm? Anyone ever heard of Jade Helm? Okay. Does anybody know when that occurred? It stands for, Jade Helm stands for Joint Assistant for Development and execution of homeland eradication of local militia. Jade, the acronym's Jade Hell. It was one of the biggest military subversive operations that have ever transpired in the United States. Most of us hadn't heard of it. But it happened during a specific time period from July 15, 2015 to September 15, 2015. This was heralded by many as being a time where a lot of people thought that the government was planning some type of military takeover. We called it what? Martial law. Martial law. Martial law. But it was a significant operation where subversive exercises were done behind the scenes, oftentimes missions that were carried out at nighttime in the midst of cities like Atlanta and New York, Phoenix. In fact, Jade Helm covered nine different states. It was the most, one of the most modern day military exercises that have ever taken place. Many have said that it is gearing up for a time in the very near future they're predicting that there will be great duress and unrest in the United States. Can you see a climate in our nation that is so provocative that we have never in time past seen? Have you seen a lot of rioting? Hasn't there been a lot of racism? Hasn't there been an upheaval and a, a, and a surge of violence and hatred being displayed. We see all kinds of hate groups coming out of the woodworks that were not there before. I mean, am I, am I imagining this or is it true? It's, it's happening. And so they're already prepping for it. And it's interesting that it finished September 15, right before the Pope comes. Right before when? You got to get this. 
It halted September 15 before the beast power, papal wrong, the abomination of desolation showed up on the scene. Why is that significant? The abomination of desolation, again, the armies. Hmm. Jake Helm, an army hmm. that shows up right before the Pope comes. And when you see the abomination of desolation surrounding the city, and they'll withdraw for three and a half years, and they'll come back. Hmm. You think that's a coincidence? I don't. And that's not the only thing. I'm going to show you more. The desolation that Jesus was referring to was the destruction of Jerusalem Temple by Rome. Listen to this. And we've seen that quote before. It has its more direct application to the future. What happened there in Jerusalem in 80, 66, 80, 70 will have its direct application in the future. Same thing. Oh, let me, let me back up. She says, during that time, we should leave the cities. Now, here's what I've showed you thus far. That the Sunday law has appeared already on the scene, encoded in the encyclical. Jade Helm, the largest military operation, operated for three months doing exercises and withdrew just before the, the Pope showed up, the abomination of desolation. And I believe that army is going to reappear, but when it does come on the scene, it's going to bring desolation. Just like A.D. 66, when three and a half years later, Rome showed up again. The armies collapsed. Now watch this. This is interesting. One day I discovered this by accident and it blew me away. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand where? In the holy place. Whoso readeth, let him what? Understand. Understand. It says the word stand there. It is the Greek word his standing. The Greek word what? His standing. Now here's what's interesting. This word appears in another context. The abomination of desolation, that's Rome. Papal Rome. When you see it stand in the holy place. Well, he came and stood in Congress. We say, well, that's not a holy place. Let's think about this. The United States is called the lamb-like beast. Do you know why it's called the lamb-like beast? Because this nation was established on biblical principles of freedom of religion. You might say holy principles. Righteousness exalted a nation. Righteousness exalted a nation, but sin is a reproach, a reproach to any people. So when the Pope came, he came and stood in a land and a country that was established on holy principles. So the abomination and of desolation came and stood, quote, in like manner in the holy place. The place of the land of freedom that God has instituted that all man should have. He came and stood. Now watch this. This work, histami, is found in Acts 17, verse 31. Because he hath, and what's that next word? Appointed. Appointed. Guess what that word is? His standing. To stand. A day in which he will judge. He has appointed a day that he will stand in judgment to the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained. Isn't that interesting? That when you see the abomination of desolation stand, his standing, it would be a time also, according to Acts 17.31, that Jesus would begin to stand in the day of the judgment to the living. Are you getting this? 
Are you understanding the implications of what could possibly be what I'm saying here? Jerusalem timeline. Three and a half years. Here it is. September 23rd, 2015. It could possibly be. I'm, again, I know I'm sounding strong. And please don't walk out of here and tell the world, oh, Pastor Brown said, yes, it's going to be. I'm telling you it's a possibility. And it's being weighed more and more on my heart. But all the signs seem to line up. I'm not asking you to believe this. You need to pray about it. But here's what I'm going to tell you. If I'm wrong with this, this possibility, all you will do by believing it is just be ready a few weeks ahead of time. But if I'm right by this probability and you ignore it, by the time we get to the end of this timeline, it'll be too late. Three and a half years. Now listen to what I'm about to say. In the parable of the ten virgins, the five wives awaken to trim their lamps. They head away. Why are they called wives? And why do they wake up? Some could say because they heard the voice of the bridegroom say, he's coming. But here's what I want you to take notice of. It was at the time of the loud cry. The what, everybody? The loud. Because the person who came and said, the bridegroom is coming, he cried with a what kind of cry? Loud. A loud cry. Now, I just told you that 400,000 people were baptized, which I believe means that we're living in the time of the latter rain. And I believe we're fastly heading toward the loud cry. What is the loud cry? The loud cry is at the highest point of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. It starts with the seal of God upon God's people. And he continues to seal and the spirit continues to grow. And more power is manifested until it reaches its height of manifest power in this earth. And it's called the loud cry. It's at that point that many people wake up up. How do they wake up? Go with me to Daniel, the 12th chapter. I'm going to show you why they, I believe they wake up. Daniel, the 12th chapter, and notice verse 4. But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal this book even to the what? Time of the end. Time of the end. Hmm. Question again, you good Bible students, you've heard it enough this weekend. When is the time of the end? The abomination of desolation. And specifically, when is that? When the papacy reveals itself. Amen? When the little horn propagates the Sabbath, the false Sabbath. Amen? When that time comes, notice what he says. That time of the end, knowledge shall increase. What knowledge? He goes throughout the chapter and he begins to explain three time periods. Time, times, and a half a time. 1,290 and 1,335. And in verse 10, he tells us, many shall be purified and made white. That's the latter rain. And tried. But the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall what? Understand. But the what? Wise. Wise shall understand. Here's what I'm saying. At the time of the end is when the wise understand. 
The time of the end is when the papal supremacy shows up. The papacy puts forth his mark of Sunday, which we have seen demonstrated in the encyclical. It will be during that time that people will wake up and become wise to the fact that we're living in that time we have talked about for so long. You can say, uh, you're free to believe whatever you want to believe. I'm not here to force you. I'm just showing to you what scripture says. Now, here's the big question that many of you perhaps are asking. Okay, wait a minute. There's so many references to spirit of prophecy where she says that there will be a pronouncement of the Sunday law. And I'm not saying it won't be. It certainly is. But here's what I think has happened to many of us. We're waiting for a formal announcement and then things will slowly build up until finally the mark of the beast will be shown by 666, an implant or whatever you want to call it. And boom, then things will happen. And I'm saying no, no, no. The Pope came. It's building up already. And by the time he announces, by the time it's announced, it's a done deal. It's a done deal. Do you see the difference? See, some are waiting for this formal cry and a slow build up, bam, and it reaches its peak. And I'm saying, no, it's building up now and it's about to reach its peak. And by the time we get to, toward the close, there, no telling what will happen. There might be a dollar crash by then. They will have totally changed the monetary system, no money. They will have chipped so many people. And then, then they will say, and for most people it will be too late because you needed to have woke up halfway through this thing at the loud cry and not trying to wait. And many of us are asleep and don't know what's happening. We haven't put the pieces together. We haven't seen what's going on. We haven't realized the possibilities. And many of us are going to be doomed. Now I know just by the law of rations, that many are going to walk out of this room and say, that was craziness he's talking about. I know that. But here's what I'm going to tell you. And you don't, I'm not here to make you, again, make you believe what I believe. But I'm telling you this is a very strong possibility and I'm about to show you why. Because I'm not finished with it yet. The Bible says, the thing that has been is that which shall be, and that which is done is that which shall be done. There is nothing new under the sun. Now look at this. The commencement of the time of trouble here mentioned does not refer to the time when the plague shall be poured out, but a short period just before they are poured out, while Christ is in the sanctuary at that time, while the work of salvation is closing, trouble will be coming on the earth. And the nations will be what? Angry. Notice this. Yet, these nations that are angry will be held what? In check. In check so as not to prevent the work of the what? Angry. Now watch this. We got some crazy leaders on the scene right now. <laughs> Kim Jong-il. This man is so got such a short fuse and the combination of our current leader in the United States and the two of them come on you know God is holding stuff in check you know it I don't I, I don't I don't have to be a rocket scientist neither do you to know that something is holding these two crazies back why? Because the work of the third angel, the latter rain is going forward so the message can continue. Yes. Amen. And she says this is a short time, the short time of trouble, just before the outpouring of the plagues. Duh. Right? Look. I, I messed up. I should have read that part. I'm sorry. Let me, let me just move forward real quick. A short time, okay, next one. Here it is. Yet held in check so as not to prevent the work of the third angel. At that time, the what? 
that rain or the refreshing from the presence of the Lord will come to give power to the loud voice of the third angel and prepare the saints to stand in a period when the seven last plagues shall be poured out. Listen, here's what I'm going to ask you to do. I want you to think about if you have seen the mighty evidence of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in these last days. Just think about it. I'm watching young men preach powerful messages that I said that could not come from their mouth. That has to be an anointing that comes only from God. I'm watching young laymen who are raising up in this message preaching the straight testimony and they're declaring it with such authority that it can be nothing but the latter rain. And, I'm, and I know that you can identify with people now who are preaching this message so strong and some who are called from the plow, some from the common ordinary ranks of life who God has promised through the servant would be called and they would do great and mighty things and you'll say, wow, and this person has never gone to school. They've never studied. They've only been at the school of the prophets sitting before God to receive his anointing. And that's what's happening. If you can't see the evidence, listen, Sermon Lord says the Holy Spirit will be falling all around many and they never even know. So if you open your eyes and if you're able to hear what the Spirit is saying and see what he's doing, you can see if you're spiritual, if you're spending time with God every day, if you're getting to know his voice, if you're, if you're seeking him with all of your heart. If you're seeking to have a relationship with God in such a way that when the time of trouble comes, you don't need a GPS to say, should I go this way or go that way? You can hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way, walk ye in it. That you will know the voice of God so much every day because you commune with him. That it's nothing for you to know what God is telling you to do. This is the place that we must reach as a people. Notice this. I knew that the time was short. And that the scenes which are soon to crowd upon us would at last come very, what everybody? Suddenly, Suddenly and swift, swiftly. He who know the truth should be preparing for what is soon to break upon the world as an overwhelming what? See, let me, let me share something with you folks. If God didn't do it the way that I believe that he perhaps is doing it now, where subversively the Pope stood and speaks as a dragon, and three and a half years from now, something's going to occur in March of 2019, if God didn't do it that way, and he just showed up on the scene and said, everybody keep Sunday, and then build up to this slow climatic you know, change where finally, bam, it comes in full force, there'll be a lot of people who will repent falsely because they'll hear it and they'll say, oh, I know that's a sign. I know that's a sign. I know that's a sign. Oh, I need to go in here and get my life right. But that's not the way the Lord operates. The wise will understand. They will see. They will pick it up. That's why the Bible says, many shall be deceived. Because he's going to come as a thief in the night. But the wise won't be deceived because they'll discern. They'll say, wait a minute. This makes sense. Something's happening. Could it be that we've gotten this thing wrong? Because we're waiting for the national Sunday law. And it's already come. And God is building up things. He's allowing things to build up behind the scenes. And bam, it's going to suddenly crumble. All at once, while we're waiting for the obvious sign to come, and many will be left without their lamps trimmed and burning. It's like, what, 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 what do I do? What do I do now? What do I, what, what do, I do? I, I can't help you. I can't help you. The work of the people of God is to prepare for the events of the future, which will soon come upon them in blinding force. When Protestants shall unite in secular power to sustain false religion opposing, which their ancestors endured the first fiercest persecution, they will then will the papal Sabbath be enforced by the combined authority of church and state. 
All right. I want you to see this. I don't know if we have a mic for this. I hope it's able to do that. Okay. Go ahead and put it in there. This took place in 2007. I want to I want to start it over because this was something that happened 10 years ago, predicting that it would take place in 2017. This is Tom. Was it Tom Brokaw? Tom Brokaw. Who is it? Brian Williams. Brian Williams. Brian Williams. For now, our special coverage here tonight, life in the U.S. in 10 years' time. By that time, there may be all kinds of new ways to safeguard and identify all of those things that make each of us unique, our faces, even our fingerprints, even our eyes. Here now with more on the future of technology, NBC's Tom Costello. The year is 2017. They rushed to a hospital on the big TV for medical history, but thanks to a microchip under your skin, it's all there. Science fiction 20 years ago, but a biometric reality today. The technology is based on that concept. That's what MI was there. Already fingerprints and virus scans verify passenger identities at airports. Within 10 years, that technology may be even more widespread. Facial recognition programs that scan a crowd of thousands looking for a single terrorist. Today's facial recognition software starts with the eyes, then it maps out the contours of the face and compares that against the database of millions, a database that's growing by the day. What's next? At the University of Bath in England, researchers predict big changes for consumers. I think it is possible to free us completely of our wants and needs. That's what people want. This is In fact, it's already here. The latest home security locks use fingerprints to control deadbolts. And at the Jewel Osco grocery store in Chicago, some customers pay using their fingerprints. No paper or plastic. You don't really need anything other than your hand and your eye So will future department stores scan our viruses, like in the movie Minority Report, then offer products catered to who we are? Hello, Mr. Yakamoto. Welcome back to the Gap. Experts say that technology is here now. The challenge is to safeguard our privacy in a brave new world. Tom Costello, NBC News, Alexandria, Virginia. Okay, listen to what I'm about to say. In 2015, as I had concluded my series on Prophecy, Science, and Doom War Order, one of my members sat several of my other members down, and I was present at the moment. Her eyes were wide open. She was aghast. And here's the reason why. She's a nurse that works for one of the leading medical institutions in our town. And she said that her boss sat them down. They had a staff meeting and said that very soon, this was in 2015, very soon they would implement the use of the microchip for medical patients for the purpose of being able to insert it under the skin to monitor high blood pressure levels, uh, blood, uh, blood levels in the body, and all types of medical uh, needs. And she was so startled because I had just shared with everyone that in many places in Europe, they're already using that microchip insert. Now, some people say, well, the mark of the beast is not a literal sign. And for so many years, we have said, oh, it's not a literal mark on the hand or nothing. But wait a minute. When John was taken up in vision, God showed him something. In other words, it wasn't just that he was, he had a, a mark, the person just had their mind made up and that was their mark. There was something to identify that he saw on the hand. You, are you following what I'm saying? So I believe that it had to have been something visible that he saw. And now this new technology of this microchip, which has been around, is really not new, it's been around for probably about 10, 15 years. Mondex was the first 
company that took hold of it and is selling it wide sale. And they predicted this. This was in 2007. And when did they say it would happen? 2017. How many of you heard this? This is breaking news. They said that there's an employee, uh, a bunch of employees, 50 of them, in Wisconsin who have already allowed them to, to microchip them in their company. That's here in the United States. If you look under Obama's bill, 4780 to 4872, page 2065, he gives reference to the Obamacare bill making exception and allowance for those who desire to have the chip implant to have it done. They put it in bill form so that when they get ready to implement it on a wide scale, they say it's already been passed as a bill. They don't, they don't need our permission. When they're ready to enforce it, they're going to do it. So here's what I'm saying. Here's one thing we do know. Let's just say for a moment, with the scenario that I've given to you, let's just say it doesn't happen in 2019, March of 2009. It may not. And we should perhaps set debts, dates, or what have you. So I'm not hard and fast on that. But here's one thing we do know. It is coming. It is coming. But here's the thing I'm telling you. Don't take a risk and throw the dice and gamble on saying, well, I'll still wait until it's announced. Because here's what I'm going to tell you. Economists have said for the longest time that the dollar is going to crash. It's foretold in the book of Ezekiel, the seventh chapter, in verse 19. Ezekiel, the eighth chapter, is the Sunday law, chapter 8 and verse 15. They're bowing to Matt Tammuz and giving honor and worshiping the sun. That's Sunday worship. Chapter 7, money crash. Chapter 8, sun worship, Sunday law. Chapter 9, seven last plagues. So the money is going to crash. When that happens, which I'm going to give you some insight here, in 1983, and when everybody? 1983. The Economist magazine, I wish I had the cover to post it to show you. On the cover of The Economist magazine, they had a picture of a phoenix, and the title said, Will There Be a World Currency? And this picture they had of this phoenix, which is a mythological bird that's supposed to rise from the ashes and, and bring new life and resurrection, right? Around his neck, he had a medallion that foretold when the possible new world currency would come into effect. Do you know what the medallion read on it? This was 1983, Economist cover. Do you know what the date was? 2018. You have people like Jim Rogers, who is a hedge fund funds financier. You've got people with, uh, uh, with the likes of uh, individuals like... Uh, uh, Peter Schiff, all of them are saying now that toward the end of this year or possibly the end of next year, there will be a crash in U.S. economy that will be worse than any time we've ever seen, even worse than 1920s. That would be a short time of trouble. And you best believe that they're not going to scramble and think of trying to figure out a solution. They already have it. And that's to get the microchip so that if you want to be able to get your funds, your monies, you're going to have to get that chip implant. And by 2000, if that happens in 2018, which it could, and maybe it won't, maybe they'll delay it, I don't know. But if it does, then we would be right on course for March 2019, where finally it will be formally introduced and everybody will have the chip and it would just be a matter of saying, okay, you're gonna die if you don't do it. Because at the end of the three and a half years, what happens? Martyrdom. Mm. Two years will mark September 15, 2017. That's about, what, a month and a half from now. That mark two years. We have a year and a half left. If that timeline happens to be right. It may, it may not. 
But if it is, we got about a year and a half left. And let me tell you something. More and more, I'm starting to be convicted about this thing. The eclipse is coming. The blood moons have fell, fallen. Jade Helm surrounded the city, or the nine states. They're coming back. And then now, we have the chip planting beginning in the United States. The Pope came in September 23rd, Day of Atonement. We have had evidence of a massive outpouring of the Holy Spirit already, and if you really look hard, you can say and identify that you've seen the movements of the Holy Spirit. I don't know how much more we can really expect. And to think if we, in the face of all of that, are to say, eh, I'll take my chance. I'm not meant to be here to scare anybody. I'm hoping that it makes us sober and not scared. That it will make us truly surrender to God and see what he's trying to say to his people. He that hath an ear, let him hear. I pray that all of us will commit our lives to Jesus in such a way that we will live for him today and not tomorrow. We need to call out to God and say, Lord, change me, cleanse me, renew me. And we need to ask God to give us a love for souls and start sharing this truth, to have a courage to let people know that Jesus is soon to return. Amen. 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 How many with me want to consecrate, commit, and rededicate your life in such a way that God will be pleased with all your actions. Amen. Can we kneel together as we close out? Father in heaven, we have talked about some serious things. Things that are happening in this world that we have read about, we have preached about, we have heard about for so many years. Many things that have slipped under the radar for many of us have gone, gone unnoticed. Lord, in the name of Jesus, please, oh God, every heart knelt here right now you read the heart. You understand the heart. I pray for each person who's making that commitment under the sound of my voice. Who says yes to God. Lord, cleanse me, renew me, revive me, restore me. That each and every person will feel the hand of God moving upon them. To make their calling and election sure. May, O oh God, we truly and indeed. Live out righteousness by faith in the one who has promised to save us if we commit our hearts and lives to him. So keep us, O oh God. Sober us and keep us faithful to the very end in the worthy and precious name of Jesus. Now, O oh God, forgive us of every sin. Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Those darling habits that we're hanging on to, give us victory over those things that we are clinging to, that you have told us time and time again, help us, Lord, to look to the cross. Help us to look to you for our strength from whence cometh our help, that we might be relieved and that Christ would no longer be suffering crucifixion. These things we pray earnestly, begging you to complete your work. We thank you, Lord, and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.